Good afternoon and thank you all for tuning in to our special edition of Bulldogs Behind the Scenes webinar featuring the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. My name is Molly Nelson and I'm part of the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations Team. Today's webinar is a partnership not only with the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, but the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. And I'm happy to introduce Steve Davis, the Director of Affinity Engagement at the UMAA. Hello everyone, as you all are coming in. Uh, I'm Steve Davis from the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. We are happy to partner with the UMB Alumni Relations Team on this behind the scenes event. If you didn't know, uh, UMAA has run our own behind the scenes series in the Twin Cities since 2015. We have explored places like WCCO TV, the UMN Libraries, U.S. Bank Stadium, Athletes Village, Faribault Woolen Mill, Urban Growler and Deneen Pottery, and the Mall of America while providing VIP U of M experiences at each. We were actually in the planning of doing an event with the uh, Minnesota Arboretum before COVID-19 changed our plans. So we're happy to adapt to this free virtual format and still offer an event. I wanted to uh, personally thank the UMD Alumni Relations Team for inspiring us to adapt to a virtual format of our behind the scenes series for now, uh, starting in partnership with this event. This will be our 15th behind the scenes event and we plan to offer more in the coming months. Uh, thank you all to the members who support the behind the scenes series that in turn keeps those events going and also supports our mission. Please find more information about upcoming events at umnalumni.org slash BTS. With that, I will turn it back to you, Molly, so we can get started with this event. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So today's webinar is hosted by Zoom. And before I introduce our guest, I'd like to note that on the bottom of the screen, there is a place for you to ask questions titled Q&A. During the presentation, feel free at any time to type your question in, and Alan will try to answer as many of them at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our alumni relations website uh, with a link to YouTube. Once the video is ready, we will send a link directly to you. So today we have the pleasure of hearing from Alan Branhagen, the Director of Operations at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. In his role, Alan supervises capital improvements, horticulture and natural resources, plant curation, and facilities and information technology. He joined the Arboretum in 2016, and for over 20 years, he was the Director of Horticulture at Powell Gardens, Kansas City's Botanical Garden, and prior to that, he served as Deputy Director of Resource Development for the Winnebago County Forest Preserve District in Rockford, Illinois. He is the author of Native Plants of the Midwest, a comprehensive guide to the best 500 species for the garden and the gardener's butterfly book. His latest book was released on July 21st, and which is a new paperback, The Midwest Plant Primer, 225 Plants for an Earth-Friendly Garden which is available at the Arboretum Gift and Garden Store. Alan is an all-around plantsman and naturalist specializing in botany, birds, and butterflies. He is cur currently creating and restoring a three-acre prairie and woodland garden around his home overlooking the Minnesota River Valley in Chaska. It is now my pleasure to welcome and hand it over to Alan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Molly, for that introduction. Well, I want to welcome you to the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Um, we are the premier Northern Landscape Arboretum, welcoming all to enjoy, learn from, and connect with nature. Our mission is to welcome, inform, and inspire all through outstanding displays, protected natural areas, horticultural research, and education. The Midwest, or the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum has its roots going back 112 years to the acquisition of the fruit breeding farm, which is now the world-renowned Horticulture Research Center best known for home of the Honeycrisp apple. And what you're seeing here is just some beautiful video. Uh, if you came out to the Arboretum and what you would see right now, there's a beautiful hibiscus in bloom. Here we have some chrysanthemums, cannas. Again, we showcase plants from all over the world, anything that will grow and create beauty for our visitor. Well, the Arboretum was purchased 62 years ago across the road from the Research Center. Its objective was based on the definition of an Arboretum as a place where trees and shrubs are cultivated for scientific or educational purposes. 
Uh, the University of Minnesota, the Minnesota State Horticultural Society, and local garden clubs raised the funds to buy that first 160 acres. And that sign is still there, but it's you, don't, you would not recognize it now. Uh, the site was also selected for its old fields set amidst remnant stands of mature big woods, including glorious sugar maples, basswoods, and northern red oaks, along with magnificent widespreading white oaks and bur oaks. The site also has spacious wetlands, including open water, marsh, a magnificent reed bed, tamarack swamps, bog, and sedge meadow. Well, the beginning forefathers of it, this institution were horticulturists, and shown there is director Leon Snyder, uh, the founding director. And they left no stone unturned acquiring and testing all plants for hardiness in our upper Midwest zone four climate and planting them in collections that have filled all the old fields and stitched this whole site together as one botanic garden like no other. I should add one of the former pastures became Minnesota's first prairie restoration. You actually saw that in the slide before, the Bennett Johnson Prairie. Al Johnson, taxonomist and plant breeder, was instrumental in establishing that plant collection or the plant collections here um, and started the Woody Plant Breeding Program in 1957. And what you're seeing now is azaleas. Um, azaleas are an example of an early collection of America's most popular shrub, formerly not hardy, but with support from the St. Paul Garden Club became a collection of at least 85 of the hardiest known species and cultivars and over 1,000 trial plants by 1960. Uh, the Northern Lights azaleas are products of this breeding research the first zone four hardy azaleas ever. And I'll tell you as a gardener, I was excited um, growing up just south of the Minnesota border in Decorah, Iowa, uh, that you could finally grow a azalea in this climate. And what you're seeing now are our research collections of azaleas. And you know, please come out in late spring and into early summer when they are in bloom because it is a spectacular collection. We don't usually think of really warm colored flowering shrubs in this zone, and it is just amazing what we've achieved through this breeding program. And again, it's in the Pine LA in the Pine Collection between Hedges and our maze, if you know this site. Um, parking near the Hedges Collection will get you to this area. Well, Leon Snyder was instrumental in the first master plan here and established the architectural theme of the site with architect Ed Lundy's designs of the Ordway Shelter and the Rose Arbor. You can see the Rose Arbor there in the beginnings of, actually, um, he raised funds to build the iconic Lundy-designed Snyder Building, and there it is completed. The Snyder Building also contains the Anderson Horticultural Library, one of the premier horticultural libraries in the country. And it also see there that it has the finest collection of George Nakashima furniture in the world, which is pretty amazing. The second director of the Arboretum, Francis DeVos, was the former um, plant breeder and assistant director of the US National Arboretum and actually founding director of the Chicago Botanic Garden. And his goal was to add attendance and build membership and accommodate more visitors out here at the Arboretum. Under his guidance, many of the core gardens in the Arboretum were established, but he also started children's education, which I think is important. And the Andrus Learning Center was built. The Horticultural Research Center and the Arboretum actually also merged at this time as one, one entity. Well, one of the ways the ARB attracts visitors is via these core gardens that DeVos uh, championed. And this includes the annual garden. And guests love to experience the beauty of flowers. And the annual garden provides a spectacular tulip display with a different color theme each season. Uh, the tulip display is designed by horticulturist Dwayne Otto using a wide variety of mid and late season varieties, usually about 35,000 plants and maybe five dozen varieties. Uh, you can see that this is this spring's display and it is a study in uh, Dwayne's favorite color red, but also includes, of course, pinks. 
And next year, it's going to be all about color. Actually, it's going to explore all different color hues. Um, so please come and see it next spring. But wow, was it spectacular in this glorious spring that we just experienced. And I'm glad at least the Arboretum was open uh, to drive through traffic to go by this this spring with the COVID-19. Well, the longest serving director was Peter Olin. He's in the middle of this picture, who was head of the University of Minnesota Landscape Architecture Program. As director, Olin completed the display gardens, including completion of the Japanese garden, which was one of the last gardens by, uh, designed by a renowned American Japanese garden designer, Koichi Kawana. He actually also did Chicago Botanic Garden and Missouri Botanic Gardens, beautiful Japanese gardens. This is also when the sensory garden was built. And a horticulture therapy program was started. And Dr. Jeannie Larson on the left there uh, leads our nature-based therapeutics in conjunction with the Bakken Center for Spirituality and he Healing. And Peter also worked with Dr. Susan Gladowich uh, to establish Spring Peeper Meadow, one of the finest sedge meadow prairie and woodland restorations around. And that's actually just taken this week. It's just spectacular now with the pink joe pie weed and the yellow cup plant in bloom and just loaded with butterflies right now. Well, Peter worked with horticulture science also to build a new HRC greenhouse and research buildings, including the Enology Lab, and seen here with our enologist, Drew Horton, so he's our winemaker, in other words, which gave the HRC a gateway into grape research. And the ARB is fast becoming the premier cold-hardy grape breeding capital with introduction of the Itasca wine grape and we are working hard to hopefully have a seedless table grape very soon. Uh, the Oswald Visitor Center was also added that, at this time, an extensive pedestrian pathway system linking all our gardens was uh, put together and the final 1200 acre boundary of this site was set. And that's our beautiful new OB, you know, Oswald Visitor Center. Well, Dr. Ed Schneider was director from 2010 to 2015, and he started with the beginning of our Chinese garden. And what you're seeing is the Chinese garden's peony pavilion in the fall and in winter. Uh, the award-winning Bee Discovery Center was designed and completed under his tenure, and it has great interactive displays and offers, if you're in that building there, look at that, panoramic views of the Arboretum property. We also established the region's finest outdoor sculpture garden under his tenure, the Harrison Sculpture Garden, which is open for viewing all year. So even in the wintertime, you could snowshoe or take um, your uh, cross-country skis out to see it. And Dr. Schneider also started our formal plant conservation program as we joined the Center for Plant Conservation. This has recently expanded into the Minnesota Orchid Conservation Program, where we are researching the secrets of how to grow all of Minnesota's native orchid species from seed. And that's Dr. David Remacall. It's amazing what he's doing. And I think we've cracked the code on most of the wild orchids of, of Minnesota and how you can grow them from seed. Well, Pete Moe has been our director since 2015 uh, and a 40 plus year old employee. Well, he raised funds and completed the ARB's new signature garden, the farm at the ARB. And the farm at the ARB includes a uh, restoration of the 100 year old Bost barn seen there. Uh, it includes commercial crop plot displays and a backyard edible gardening components. Um, those are actually pollinator friendly beds there uh, between the Bost Barn and the Bee Center. And we also have, um, as we know, farming now to have areas to invite beneficial insects like that helps actually with uh, controlling insect pests, working with Mother Nature instead of against her. That area there we call Fruitful Way, just put in um, around two beautiful event lawns. You could put up tents or have events out in that space and look at the glorious view that's to the west over the rest of the Arboretum. We 
again, looking at some of the planting pollinator pieces. The bee center actually was in the background there. Those are the crop plots, which I think is really good to, for people to see how um, up close and personal there's winter wheat and spring wheat on the right. A lot of people drive by these things and never get to see what, what they look like up close. Uh, corn and soybeans, rye and barley, how apples are grown uh, today is also showed there, and a vineyard. And it's the first time that all the introductions of the University of Minnesota are, are in one site. All of the grapes that we introduced, minus one moonbeam, which is lost and then all 20, uh, well actually 25 of our 27 varieties of apples that have been introduced. There actually, that is um, the apple orchard, it, the new way that they're grown on trellises. Again, our vent lawn. All right, well, Pete Moe was also instrumental that the ARB acquired the Lake Tamarack property, saving it from development and ensuring the protection of that lake as it provides irrigation for the Horticultural Research Center. Beautiful, beautiful lake and again open to the public. Well, the Arboretum is currently a 1200 acre horticultural mecca, about the 15th largest botanical garden in the country in terms of annual budget. Research uh, continues with the release of the first kit Kiss Apple, which I think hopefully everyone's tried it, should be coming right shortly here, one of the early ripening varieties. There's Dr. Jim Luby on the left and uh, David Benz De Benford on the right. And he's the one who actually has to taste all these uh, apples that they're uh, testing out there. And he's the one who, whose taste buds actually discovered the Honeycrisp apple. And of course, that we are actually gonna introduce a yet to be named apple this year, and actually another new pair. Um, but we're also, you know, adding new landscape plants, electric lights, azalea has just been re, uh, released and, and also coming down the pike is a yet to be named for Sibia. Well, the ARBS uh, gardens and, mo and model landscapes include 52 plant collections, including the pine and grass collections, which are nationally accredited plant collections by the American Public Gardens Association. But one of our most popular collections is the crab apple collection. And look at that, I mean, People want to know when the crab apples are blooming at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. And I also want to add that the Arboretum is also accredited by the American Alliance for Museum uh, Museums as all our plants and fine art on the site are professionally curated. But our crab apple collection has historic and modern uh, varieties. The national collection is actually at the Morton Arboretum, but we have material they don't have and have, have sent them things. Again, those first forefathers were really uh, sharp in getting all these neat varieties. Some of them are very rare from England or rare in the wild, like the Biltmore crab from the Southern Appalachians. And as you can see, it is just a spectacular display, usually around May 10th, but again, Mother Nature uh, dictates when that display will be. That's actually Three Mile Walk, which goes right through that uh, collection. One of the ways to uh, tour the site. Well, the Arboretum is open year round with an ever-changing display of plants for each season. There's our annual garden in the summer. From the magic of our woodland azalea garden, right there was spectacular this spring, and crab apples in springtime. There's some more in the gardens besides seeing the collection. And that's actually behind Sculpture Hill. The crab apples are spectacular there. Come explore our miles of trails with plenty of space and fresh air so that you can reconnect with nature. How about that beautiful image? And there's our, our bog walk. And again, many, many places for kids to connect with nature. It's actually at the Learning Center. And then again, our azaleas when they're in peak bloom. And I wish we could uh, transfer the fragrance <laughs> that you smell as you walk through that collection. I bet you didn't know there were that many azaleas. And of course, um, open all seasons, the beautiful fall colors here. 
It's actually our busiest month, the month of October. And we grow our own pumpkins at the HRC and then offer them for sale, but are also a big component of our fall displays. Usually having a pumpkin house like that, which makes a good photo op. And of course, we live in Minnesota. You gotta love winter and it's incredible ethereal beauty. And we are open year round. Uh, we also celebrate winter with our winter in bloom displays uh, open, will, will yet to be named yet this winter, um, open in the evenings. And I really want to invite you to come join us. Perfect. Well, thank you, Alan, for providing us a tour of the Arboretum. It's certainly colorful this time of year. Um, right now, we're going to transition to our question and answer portion of the webinar. And we did ask questions ahead of time through the registration. However, now is the time for you to submit your own questions using the Q&A function located on the bottom of your screen. So our first question asks, what are the northern grapevine and fruit varieties that have been developed? Well, it's amazing. Um, there, for grapes, we've actually introduced 11 varieties. And for fruit in general, you know, you heard me mention during the program, 24 uh, apples, with three crab apples, so edible crab apples, so that's a total of 27 there. Um, we have, I gotta get to my notes, five varieties of raspberries are introduced, three types of ever, ever bearing strawberries, and 13 strawberries. And it's shocking, plums actually used to be very, very popular, though they've kind of fallen out of popularity, but the uh, Arboretum has introduced 22 varieties of plums. Wonderful. Uh, well, our next question uh, asks, please address the most exotic plants, flowers, et cetera, that the Arboretum is able to grow outdoors and what actions are taken to allow them to survive the harsh Minnesota winters? That's a great question. And one of the biggest reasons we are here is to actually test plants for what Minnesota weather has to throw at them. So we don't protect them at all. We want to, to learn and uh, see how they survive on their own. Um, we have a lot of very, very rare plants here. Um, we actually, as I mentioned, as part of the Center for Plant Conservation, are in charge of seven um, endemic, so uh, Minnesota and upper Midwest regional wild uh, plants, including the Minnesota dwarf trout lily, which is found in only a few counties in southern Minnesota. And we have uh, uh, collections of all the wild populations on site here, and we're preserving them what's called ex situ. So if anything happened to them in the wild, we actually have backups that we could bring them back to nature. We're also, excuse me, the Western Prairie Fringed Orchid is another one we're in charge of. But in terms of trees and shrubs, uh, it's, we have the Koyama spruce, which is one of the rarest trees in the world, native only on a couple mountaintops in Japan, or the, uh, another Japanese one, the Sokoku Island fir, which is only found on two mountaintops in Japan. Um, Prince Ruprex larch, another very rare larch species from Western China, um, a seaside alder, which you would, it's a very rare plant to North America with two really weird locations growing in Maryland in one location and in Oklahoma in one location. And our plants are from the Oklahoma population and they're perfectly happy in Minnesota. So we have, you know, it's, it's hard to say which one is the rarest, but we have many. Our next question asks, how has the changing climate impacted the Arboretum? And what changes have you had to make to adapt to this changing climate? Well, luckily those forefathers really pushed the limit on what they could grow here and actually planted a lot of things that weren't necessarily hardy. The one thing that we've learned and we can document it based on their notes is that a lot of things that were not hardy here in the past 20 years have become hardy here. Uh, things like the vernal witch hazel, uh, cornelian cherry dogwood, smoke trees. Um, originally, all the notes talk about them dying back. And of course, lately they have not died back and bloomed and fruited beautifully, even, even in the polar vortex year. Um, another great example is our, um, our oak and nut tree collection. We actually have about 13 pecan trees 
And with recent uh, record long growing seasons, we've actually for the first time in history, I believe it was actually 2017, um, we had pecans actually ripen here at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. So um, our collections, uh, I think, are already designed to be resilient for climate change. And of course, we will be trying more southern plants um, to test their hardiness. And it looks like we have a couple of questions curious about the individuals and volunteers that have helped um, at the Arboretum and wondering, do you have volunteer gardeners during COVID-19? And if so, how do you support their safety? Well, right now um, they are, are not allowed. Um, we have requested permission through CFANS uh, and uh, are working with our volunteer coordinator to set up uh, protocols to ensure their safety. So we're working on it and we really, really miss our volunteers. They are the ones that, um, the best way I can put it, they put the spit polish shine on all the things that uh, we, we do here. So they're real important to us and we look forward to bringing them back safely. We have a question wondering, are there bike paths and trails um, on the property? That's a really great question. We, um, if, if you came to the Arboretum right now, you would notice all this construction along the north side of our property along Highway 5 and it's the new TH5 uh, multi-use bike trail, which will link us to all the metropolitan areas trail systems. So for the first time, you'll be able to safely access the Arboretum by bike. And we are already, um, our three mile drive, which goes through the site and then the Eastern drive, which links to that uh, beautiful farm at the Arb, all of that is currently open for bikes. And so you can, you can do a fairly good bike, uh, bike ride here and we are excited to have that linking into the new trail. We do not allow bikes on all the uh, pedestrian paths or in the gardens, but it, it still is a great biking experience. Our next question wonders about the animals that call the Arboretum home. Um, how do you keep out the bunnies and deer from the formal display gardens? <laughs> it's always a really good question. Um, we, the best way is fencing. We have, you know, really, um, nice green uh, rabbit proof fencing around our lily collection, so to speak. Uh, we have a deer fence all the way around the site and uh, the completion of that will be with the new bike trail. Um, and so our best method is to uh, fence them out. So during your presentation, we saw the beautiful colors of the tulip gardens. This question asks, does the Arboretum plant new tulip bulbs every year and if so, what happens to the old bulbs? We, we do plant them every year. And unfortunately, tulips really are just an annual in this, uh, in this climate. So yeah, they do, they do get composted each year and we start fresh. Because if you did replant them, you'd, you'd get a pretty weak plant for the most part, unless you have just a really well-drained, baking hot site where they can go dormant for the summer. And obviously we have to have um, the, the plants have to look absolutely premier, so we can't have um, second rate when, you know, a second year on them usually. They're just not, not as showy, if at all. So we plant new each year. So another plant related question regarding azaleas. So this person asked, I never saw an azalea growing outdoors until I came to New York. Are they common in Minnesota now? Is it related to global warming? Well, again, it, uh, when I talked about the Northern Lights Azaleas in the breeding program here at the, at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, we were the first ones to get them hardy for Minnesota. Um, and the Northern Lights series is, I think it's uh, 16 different varieties with flower colors um, from white to orchid, purple, orange, yellow. Um, so we really can grow a cross section of them here really well. All right, and we have a question about admissions and wondering if you can talk about uh, the kids' admissions, uh, U of M students' admissions, um, if you're able to, to cover, sure. cover that. Anyone who is 15 or under, doesn't have a driver's license, is free. And uh, all, of course, students are also, um, University of Minnesota students are also free. But I do have to remind you during this COVID, um, we, you must purchase your ticket in advance. And we have 200 available every half hour, so you shouldn't have any issue. Um, and then we're also open on Thursday evening. So this, uh, I, 
I believe this Thursday is our first uh, Thursday evening open till eight o'clock. Okay, and back to some plant questions. Wondering about invasive species, um, are they natural and how do you maintain them? Yes, we're always on the lookout uh, for invasive species. Right now, our uh, wood duck pond is choked like many wetlands in Minnesota with a, a hybrid cattail. And we actually got the permits and are starting a restoration process to remove that and restore that wetland. Um, Reed canary grass is another one, Canada thistles, actually some of the ornamental plants, we always monitor all of them, but things like the Amur maple that was used to be a very popular ornamental tree for its fall color has become invasive and now we are, um, it's called deaccessioning it from our collections and removing it where it's escaped from the wild. Burning bush is another one that people are kind of shocked by that it is now escaping in Minnesota woodlands and becoming an issue. So. Um, we do monitor all collections for that if they're not native, but um, really invasive plants are, are, not, are not native imported plants that again are growing um, to the point where they're usurping or you know, taking over uh, indigenous plants. So this next question relates to the art and sculptures on the grounds. Um, will you ever bring Bruce Monroe back for more art installation? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I actually don't know the answer. I, I can't say no, but um, right now our, our winter in bloom theme is more based on um, celebrating the specifics of our site and maybe lighting our trees, um, showing them in a whole new light, so to speak. And we have a lot of light features that are based on the plants we've introduced, like the Northern Lights Azalea and apples and our um, Northern Gold Presidia. So, um, we're, we're trying to focus more on that, kind of authentic to what we are. And we will end our session with a couple of ground questions. Um, is the walkway around the barn available this summer? If so, where do you park so that you can walk the area around the barn? Yeah, it's um, as of last week, just Eastern Drive opened up off of Three Mile Drive to get you back to the farm at the ARB. Uh, there is parking right there at the B Center um, or handicapped parking right along uh, side the farm at the Arb there. And yes, it, those paths are open to come explore that now. And our last question, wondering about hours. Um, do you need to make an appointment to visit the Arboretum? Um, what should people know if they'd like to visit? Yes, um, you do need to make an appointment. And um, I think the first uh, 9 a.m. Is, is the first available tickets. And then um, I'm embarrassed, I think it's 3.30, uh, the last ones for the evening and we're open till six o'clock. I take that back, it's 4.30, excuse me now, 4.30. And then on Thursdays, um, we are open till eight. So I believe it's all the way till 6.30 that you could get your ticket. But yes, you have to order them. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for taking the time to share with us, with us the exclusive look at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. It's exciting that you have all reopened and we encourage everyone to stop for a visit to see the gardens for yourselves. If you have any other questions that weren't answered today, feel free to reach out to either the Arboretum or our office and we'll try to get back to you with an answer. Also, please keep an eye out for our upcoming online learning sessions. Our next program features a tour of the University of Minnesota Forestry Center in Cloquet, Minnesota. Again, a big thanks to Alan and the UMAA, and we hope that you'll join us at future online events. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Alan and the UMD Alumni Relations Office. This was an amazing virtual tour of the Arboretum. Um, I would like to add the caveat that uh, UMAA will Hopefully within the next year or so, when things are deemed safe, uh, try to do something physical at the Arboretum as well. But please be on the lookout for more of these virtual opportunities coming from UMAA uh, with a lot of different behind the scenes opportunities uh, that we can find. So thank you once again. Have a great day. Thanks.